Joining Bill and, and talking about the Rumler Group years is, uh, is Alan Ramis. And Alan went on to be a colleague at the Rumler Brace Group and, and is now a partner in the Performance Design Lab. Um, I first met Gary in 1981. Um, having recently joined Motorola, I was one of those people that Bill Wiggenhorn hired when he started up a training organization there pretty much from scratch. Nobody liked us then. Nobody knew what we were trying to do there. And so what Bill did was bring in a series of people to help us design the organization and begin to make an impact. And uh, Gary was one of the first people who came in. And I was awestruck um, for two reasons. I was impressed with people who had gray hair. I was fairly young at the time, and, and uh, both Bill and Gary had gray hair. So. Um, and, and, but two, I had been a training manager for several years um, before taking that job. And I read an, uh, an article called, You Want Performance, Not Just Training. And it really changed the entire way I looked at what I was trying to do, changed the way I went about my work. And so I was already in awe of what this guy knew versus so many other things I had already learned. And then there he was standing in front of me, which just was kind of incredible. Um, and Motorola turned out to be the opportunity of a lifetime for me personally. Just joining the company, I joined it at the right time because um, MTech, as it was called, the corporate training organization, had a huge impact on Motorola. And then after I was there about a year, uh, about 1982, I was given the second opportunity of a lifetime to work with Gary and this wild manufacturing guy, Paul Heidenreich, to try to create what we first thought was going to be a training program for managers, and then it turned out to be a performance improvement methodology um, that we packaged and, and uh, has since had a huge impact, not just on Motorola, but a lot of other companies. So I just, I was lucky enough to get the assignment, work with those guys on uh, doing that, and so that's what I want to tell you about, is how that methodology evolved kind of impact it had on Motorola in those years, and then really has had legs because it's the, the kind of work that we've been doing ever since. So here was my job, though. I was about a decade younger than Gary and Paul, so that made me the kid. And, and the other thing I was kind of up against was my job was to try to capture what they were doing. And what they were doing changed every time they did it. So they went into different organizations, cr kind of created the methodology. I'd follow in behind. I'd try to package that. I'd go into the next session. I'd show them all this stuff. And they'd say, God, that's wonderful. That's not what we're going to do. <laughs> um, so it just, I, so you know, my job was almost you couldn't do it. I could not do my, and I had a deadline. To, to, to provide a deliverable to him, and I finally did it, but I knew it was fairly shaky because what they were out there doing actually was not what was in that package, but that was the, kind of the best I could do. What I learned from that, though, as aggravating as it was in some ways, is that that's actually the way Gary worked. He worked on stuff, and 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 this turned out to be the earliest iterations of the, the uh, methodology he continued to work on all of his life. So to show you a little bit of that and how it evolved, early on it was something called the organizational performance system. So it was a methodology for looking at a given organization, figuring out what the current design was, and then trying to ask some smart questions about how well that was working and how it might change, right? So the early, early version. And if we focus in on that box down at the bottom called situation analysis, these were the questions that were in the methodology at that point. What is happening now? What should be happening? Define your desired outputs. Well, today, that's known as as is. Whoops. As is in 2B, it's turned in to the core methodology in Six Sigma and BPM practice all over the world in all kinds of corporations. And very relatively few people know that this was the origin of this. Those two little questions, what's happening now and what should be happening, have now been picked up, adopted by people who don't even know that it actually came from Gary Rummer. But his impact has been enormous. Um, but then, and what I found out was, well, that's the way this is going to work. You're going to package it, and you're going to repackage it, and you're going to add to it, and it's going to evolve and get better and better and better, but it will never be perfect. So let me tell you a little bit about what then happened 
in those early years. So we packaged up this early version and started to try to use it. And this was Motorola at that time. It was, consisted of some major businesses. The one on the left-hand side is the semiconductor business. At that time, it was about 50% of the organization. Uh, so, you know, huge and made up of many divisions, product divisions inside. And so after I had worked on, on this program at corporate training, I was transferred out to, to uh, the Phoenix area where the semiconductor business was. So my job changed at that point. I was a training manager out in the field. The semiconductor product divisions were my client. And even though I was a training guy, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to apply that methodology. So I started hunting for clients inside the semiconductor division, and after a little bit of work, started finding them. So the first one was a guy named Tommy George. He was a senior general manager. I know that doesn't sound like a senior general manager. In fact, he was a, a rather scary engineering PhD type, but his name was Tommy. But he had a new business, the ASIC business, that was not going very well and, uh, and wanted some help. So this was our first opportunity. Critical business issue there was um, very bad time to market for this business called Semi-Custom. They were trying to compete with other organizations that were far ahead of them, so they were pretty unhappy about this. But the other thing about this is the way this new business was, was being developed and run is it actually crossed several existing organi organizational units, right? So it's a business built on top of other businesses. And so we gather them together using this methodology. And it was actually the very first time the senior managers had ever talked together about that business. Somebody had come up with that design, never pulled them together to say, guess what, you're all now in the ASIC business. So the, we did that and, uh, and had them talk about what it is they were trying to accomplish in common. So we ran this workshop. It was the first real application of this performance improvement methodology out in the field. Two weeks after the workshop, that division got moved to another group, so we thought, Nice try, but we no longer have a client, it's dead. Now we had a new senior manager in there, so I spent eight months going back to that senior manager and trying to convince him that he ought to take a look at what happened there. And for a considerable period of time, he was just not interested. Eventually, we convinced him to do that. Turns out, though, that even though the senior management had changed, the folks at the next level down liked that design so much that they put it in place and started to run the business according to that new design. And so it turned out, when we pulled them back together, that they'd actually cut cycle time in half, 14 weeks, down to seven weeks in nine, in nine months, without any particular direction from the, from the top. And so that business, which actually looked like this, was one of the first real applications of the pro process improvement methodology I know you can't see that very well, but you can see it well enough to see that what it illustrated for Gary, and this was the first time he said it to a, a management group, is, folks, you've got a lot of white space on that chart, which you have to manage. This was the, the, the first time he came out with that, that line. And of course, that's what they were trying to do, manage across all of those interconnects, or lack thereof, between all of these business groups. So. That was, that was our first outing and highly successful. What we thought we could do on the basis of that was go right from that and find a lot of other clients. What ha actually happened instead was the semiconductor business went into the tank for about a year and a half, so we couldn't get anybody to spend any money on anything. But about 1987, we got involved in trying to revitalize this. Well, what Gary had been doing in the, mean, in the meantime is going out to other clients. He went out to GTE in particular, several other clients. He, he kept pushing the methodology further. So by 1987, this is what it looked like. And so now what you can see is the three levels. Organization, process level, and job level had been built into the methodology. So he came back to Motorola, and what we wanted to do in semiconductor is re revitalize our business after, uh, after going into a stall for a while by applying Gary's stuff in some of the same organizations that we had been in before. 
And so our first outing there was with a gentleman named Steve Hansen, who had actually been involved in that 1984 effort, was a middle manager. Now it's stepped up to a product division, and as soon as he got up to that level, he said, I want to do that stuff we did back in 1984. So we took a look at his business, which was an, across the international lines. In this particular case, it was a huge order fulfillment process. Total cycle time at the beginning of the workshop was 17 weeks. Six months later, based on that design, took it down to 10 weeks. 18 months later, down to five days. This is the one, this was the project that broke the dam. This was the one that got corporate attention and should have, and really got people interested in trying to redesign their businesses this way. So what that led to, and, that, and so what that means is this spread well beyond semiconductor, though, though that's where I stayed. And that's where my focus was. So just to add a little bit more then. So then we went on from there to work at a group level up from product divisions. So here's some, some data on what we did there. Worked across three divisions in the 87, 89 time frame, cutting days of cycle time out. And what we did was make an estimate of what we were saving for every day of cycle time. So the estimate is in that period of time, about 13 million. I've been told by some people in semiconductor that's probably um, wrong by a factor of five, it was much more. But who cares when you're getting that kind of, uh, kind of data? Also, Gary's stuff then, when it got back up to corporate level, was repackaged and put into Six Sigma programs. A lot of people don't know that, partly because of the title. They think the emphasis is on statistics. But it had always been a combination of TQM tools with process improvement tools. So Gary's stuff was integrated into Six Sigma. Motorola had by that time bought a license for Gary's stuff, and so they repackaged his material. And so what a lot of practitioners out in Six Sigma don't know is they're practicing some variation. There are many variations, but some variation of uh, Gary Rumler's stuff. His contributions then at Semiconductor. He offered process improvement methodology throughout the sector, eventually got packaged in the Six Sigma program. He worked in every product division of semiconductor. He worked in many of the other parts of the, the business from corporate all the way down to department level. And he provided both measurable results and a way of talking about the business that we hadn't had before. White space, disconnects, the organization as a system, the whole concept of cross-functional processes came from him. And it had a huge impact and lasting impact on that organization. Of course, it went from there to many other places. So I was a very lucky person. Right time, right place, right? So his personal contribution to me was, frankly, he changed my life. Um, he was incredibly generous. He was incredibly generous with his time, with his ideas, with his coaching, and I do miss him greatly. <laughs>